work. Um, my organization, which started in 1970, uh, long before I was there, um, we are now 53 years old, and each year we activate about a billion people worldwide. Uh, we are really excited to be here at the COP talking about education uh, broadly, but we're also very excited about today's panel. Uh, one of our speakers is actually going to be speaking by video uh, in a moment. But first, let me tell you about the panel. Uh, the, uh, the panel was, sorry, I have to put on my glasses. Uh, uh, the, the, the panel um, is powered by the Fashion Impact Fund, reimagining fashion, women's leadership in advancing climate action. And today we have Carrie Bannigan, as I said, our first speaker. Uh, we'll actually be on by video. She's a social entrepreneur pi pioneering global fashion and media initiatives to advance creative economy as a driving force for sustainable development. As the founder and executive director of the Fashion Impact Fund, Carrie spearheads high-level partnerships with business, governments, and the UN to support female founders in the fashion industry that are leaning sustainable fashion solutions. The charitable fund provides grants to women-led education, media, and workforce development programs that advance the fashion industry and its change. The fund is committed to accelerating women's economic empowerment and leadership as female founders trailblaze initiatives that are addressing the critical issues of our time and collectively transforming communities for people on the planet. Kerry serves as the president of the board at the Public Foundation, providing strategic advisory for uh, impact programs and partnerships, including the UN Family Office for Sustainable Development, SDG Media Summit, G8 Young Summit, and the G7 Environment. Just before we um, launch Kerry's video, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Earth Day's fashion campaign, uh, which is much more recent um, than uh, many of our other programs. But we deeply believe that fashion um, is a critical component. As we know, it represents at least 6% of climate emissions worldwide, um, not including all of the labor issues, pollution issues, or plastic issues associated with the campaign. So we are focused as uh, an organization that works year-round on education, plastics, climate change, in really highlighting the impacts of climate and educating people water, which is new. Exactly. Hello. We are back and we are live. Um, just to finish up, EarthDay.org's fashion program is really about education, highlighting all the issues associated with the fashion industry, particularly the fas fashion industry. Um, and so we're really happy to be here today and what I hope will be the beginning of a global campaign already led by my speaker today, who I'd like to introduce. But first, we'll show a two-minute video prepared by Carrie Bannigan, who I just um, told you a little bit about her background. So thank you. Hello, I am Kerry Bannigan, Executive Director of the Fashion Impact Fund. Thank you for joining us today at the Climate Education Hub, powered by Earth Day. The upcoming discussion will explore the intersection of fashion and climate change. The fashion industry is responsible for vast negative social and environmental impacts, including water pollution, textile waste, exploited labor, poverty, gender equality, and climate change. Globally, the $2.4 trillion fashion industry employs more than 300 million people along the value chain. Of the 75 million garment workers, 80% of these workers are women between the ages of 18 and 35, and the majority earn less than $3 per day. 
Additionally, the fashion industry accounts for about 10% of global carbon emissions and nearly 20% of wastewater. 35% of all microplastics released into the world's oceans are from synthetic textiles. Female founders are advocating for a new paradigm in the fashion sector, one that leads towards a fair, inclusive and regenerative world. So often these agents of change represent vulnerable and marginalized populations. It is imperative to accelerate women's economic empowerment and leadership as they continue to trailblaze solutions that are addressing the critical issues of our time and collectively transforming communities for people and planet. Thank you, Earth Day, for hosting us and enjoy the discussion. Perry is uh, an extraordinary person who's one of the great leaders in the fashion industry. Uh, this panel discussion is going to highlight the role of the $2.4 trillion fashion industry in combating climate change and its impact, specifically exploring the women-led initiatives that are advocating for a new paradigm in the fashion sector, one that leads to a fair, inclusive, and regenerative world. So we've turned this into more of a fireside chat without the fire, thank goodness, um, although it is pretty cold in here. Uh, so I'd like to introduce a fabulous woman, Arizona Muse. She is one of the world's most recognizable models, an environmental activist and founder of DIRT, a charity that supports and promotes biodynamic farming as a solution to soil de degradation and the climate crisis as a whole. Arizona, Arizona also acts as a sustainability consultant and sits on the board of not-for-profits, including the Sustainable Angle, a leading resource for sourcing sustainable materials, an ambassador for Greenpeace and Women for Women, and has collaborated on multinational campaigns with Oxfam, the UN, UNDP, UNEP, and UNFAO. So welcome, Arizona. Um, I'm going to let you take it away and talk to us about how you became moved from a fabulous model um, to a fabulous activist and how it was possible for you to go through that transition and what led to this massive introduction into that part of your life. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. So good to meet you, Kathleen, and get to know you, knowing all the incredible work that you've done and spent your life doing. It's just, wow. Thank you on behalf of everyone for everything that you've done. I started modeling very young, as most models do, and I have now been modeling for 12 years. But about halfway through those 12 years, I realized I actually didn't know anything about the clothes that I was helping to sell. And so I started learning about them. I started asking Google, mostly, what is cotton? How is cotton grown? And then I started watching documentaries and reading books and learning that, wow, this industry is full of exploitation, both human and environmental. And it was a learning journey that changed my life forever. I will never go back. Once you know these things, as many of you here, I'm sure, are on that learning journey, once you know them, you do make different decisions. Education is the key here. We do live our lives differently if we know what is happening down deep on the other side of a supply chain that until we educated ourselves, we didn't even know that supply chain existed. So for me, it's just been an amazing journey that actually healed a lot in myself. Modeling had me feel horrible about myself. And this is surprisingly common in models. We don't look at pictures of ourselves and go, oh, I look so beautiful. We look at pictures of ourselves and think, how gross am I? How disgusting? And we hate ourselves. And it's really weird. And you wouldn't expect that. And I didn't expect that going into modeling. And activism has started, it started straight away eight years ago when I started educating myself to heal me. It gave me a passion. It gave me something to learn about, something to care about and think about that wasn't just obsessing about what I looked like because as a model it everyone around you is just looking at what you look like and that's all they talk to you about so naturally you become quite obsessed about what you look like and it's a very unhealthy obsession that goes deep in your head and you eventually have no space for anything else at all and you just feel totally bored with your life but stressed and bored like excruciatingly bored not like oh I'm bored and what do I do and activism healed that so that's a story I like to share because everyone in the world, we can all find our inner activist. I became an activist full time. This is all I do now. And I model occasionally still, but 
it's who I am. I'm living this life and I love it. And I feel strong and I feel empowered and I'm curious. And I would never have guessed that I had an activist in me ever because I was a very shy child. I would have, I was hiding behind my mom's skirt, like that kind of shy, shy child. And now I love public speaking. I don't, it doesn't bother me. I get excited by it, in fact. And if you'd asked me when I was 12, do you think you'll become a public speaker? I would have literally run in the other direction because no, I would never have guessed that. But it's just, it's amazing how when you have a passion that's outside of yourself, that's not about you, that's about something so much greater and so much more beautiful, it, it is empowering. And it actually is the essence of living and per having purpose and meaning is so important in life. So that's, it's just nice to, to think about that because activism doesn't have to be harsh and scary and shouty. It can be any form that you want it to take. And you don't have to quit your job to do activism. In fact, the best kind of activist is that the one who keeps his or her job and brings their activism into their professional life because that's how we're gonna make change. And we need to make change urgently because we are in a climate crisis right now with absolute ecosystem breakdown everywhere we look. Thank you, that was really great. Um, I'm supposed to talk a little bit about how I came to activism, but I think I was born an organizer and came from a big family and was constantly gathering people up to do things, so I came at it from a very different perspective. But even though I was an organizer, if you put me in front of a microphone or I had to walk across a room full of usually men in my business, it became really intimidating and it took me forever to get over it. Um, but somehow I sort of hit my stride and before I came to Earth Day, I had spent a lot of my life in litigation and suing governments, one of my favorite things to do, or corporations. Amazing. Um, it's actually a lot easier than you think because so many laws are written that allow you to do just that. So in the United States in particular, uh, you can sue the government for failing to uphold its own laws. So, And we made a lot of money doing it because you get attorney's fees. But when I came to Earth Day, um, out of this background, um, I, and I'd also been in journalism for a little while, I sort of went 180 degrees in my life and decided that um, really what, I fell in love with the planet, um, talking about whether what we love, and um, I also fell in love with education. And so uh, what we're doing here is promoting global education and fashion and plastic and other issues um, but again, Earth Day is about, I call us about everybody else. The environmental community is there, but Earth Day is about everyone else. And so I really enjoyed, and sometimes it's complicated, having Earth Day be the big tent, and you often have people in that tent that you'd like to slug. But for most part, Earth Day is an extraordinary experience of people coming together. And increasingly, we've been really driven um, by climate change, but then if you really look at the issues, we've also been driven by issues that are important, um, not just in fashion, but as we talked about earlier, in sustainable agriculture. So I'd like to ask you some questions about that, if you don't Thank mind. Thank you for sharing about your history. I love that. Yeah, it's a Turns out we should all be litigating against our governments for the laws that they're failing to uphold, yeah. which sounds so simple when you put it like that. And uh, my life was not exactly linear. I even owned a bakery at one point in my life, and baked a lot, all the food, um, but entered the legal world um, and then again fell in love with the planet and decided to become an environmental lawyer. Um, and so we really welcome um, your entry into this business and your experience and how you've become such an important voice for not just fashion but so many other issues. Uh, so let me ask you the first question. Um, your focus on biodynamic agriculture I still have to find out exactly what that means. Can change the we'll fashion. get into that. Good. Uh, can change the fashion industry for good and advance climate action. What exactly is this, and what would be the benefits? So, through my activism journey, I started learning about the fashion industry. As I said, the supply chain, which is many, many links deep, and I kept being brought back to soil. All of our fashion is grown in soil. But do we say thank you so much farmers for growing our clothes? No, we didn't even know that they did it. And that is a huge problem in the industry and we need to fix that. So I just, 
I became really passionate about farming. I volunteered on farms a lot, and I still do, and all the time I spent on farms, I just began to feel so connected to nature, and I, I started to realize that, wow, these people working with land are so intelligent. The way they observe life, what they speak about, how they speak, everything was different to what I was used to in an urban city life. And so I decided to start an organization to support farmers because one thing was very, very clear that I kept seeing, they're totally under-supported and under-appreciated for all the amazing work they are doing all year long. And a lot of the work they do all year long is not actually growing crops. But at the end of the year, the only thing they get paid for is growing crops. And that's something that we really need to change. Farmers, every day of their careers, are performing ecosystem services for the greater good. And that's all free work that they do, but wouldn't it be amazing if we could pay them for that? And people have tried, and it always inflates the price of the crop, so much so that it's not friendly in the marketplace and it doesn't get bought. So that's not the answer. The answer is to actually value what they're doing, the work they're doing, and pay them straight for the work so it doesn't affect the price of the crop. So the price of the crop still stays where it needs to be in the market to attract buyers. These are all the things that I'm thinking about and working on with the charity that I started last year called DIRT. And DIRT is in existence to support farmers, particularly biodynamic farmers. And biodynamic farmers are, it's a type of agriculture and it's global, but it's a very tiny movement. It's nearly 100 years old and it's very under known for was me. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I might have been the problem all along. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I doubt it. And biodynamic agriculture builds soil fertility through composting. Th and composting is essentially breeding microorganisms. It's creating a pile, a nest, for bi microorganisms to play and have fun and eat and poop and have sex and make babies. That's what microorganisms do. And they do it in soil and we need to support that life. And when we spray chemicals on farms, we're doing the opposite. We're killing the life within soil. And when that life is dead, it's not moving. And when it's not moving, the soil compacts and gets really stiff and then water can't stay in it. And the water runs off, causing erosion. All of these things are caused by poor soil fertility, which is why Sounds a little random and specific, but this is why I started an entire charity just to support soil regeneration in the face of the climate crisis, because it is a big deal. It's one of our greatest climate solutions, and biodynamic farming is a gem of a climate solution that everybody needs to know about and that our governments need to know about and start supporting the adoption of it, because what I've learned is that conventional, agri uh, conventional farmers, they can't just go, oh yeah, I'd like to switch, that would be fun. No, it's, it, it costs something. And conventional farmers are stuck under a debt barrier. They have debt on their equipment. They have debt on their seed. They have debt on the chemicals that they buy. They don't, they don't have the freedom to just say, oh yeah, I'd like to become regenerative. It's not that easy for them. So governments to support that transition so that all of our food and all of our fashion, leather, fibers like cotton, hemp, and silk, and wool can be grown in a way that doesn't cause harm to the soil and actually rebuilds the soil fertility underneath our feet. Yeah, we were talking earlier, and this is not one of the questions, but uh, when we had a chance to chat, uh, we talked about how farmers are increasingly um, being introduced to the concept of taking small particles of plastic and integrating it into their soil. And the kind of practices that Arizona talking about a sort of an anathema to her world. But increasingly, we're finding that the pressure to provide food to the world undermines constantly the farming community. Although I'm not from a farming family directly, my mother's family were all farmers, and so I know how important it is. And along those lines, maybe you could talk, and I'm expanding a question that I asked you, the intersection between fashion, climate, in agriculture and how would you sort of tell the public the world that knows so little about the impact of fashion on climate change 
how would you explain it to people? Because Earth Day is in the business of educating people, so we'd be really interested to hear your perspective. So first of all, let's break down the word fashion. When I say the word fashion, it makes me think of the high fashion industry of the fancy labels and glossy magazines. But really, what we're talking about is the garment industry. The garment industry, meaning every single piece of clothing, shoes, handbags that anyone is wearing in the entire world, that's what we mean when we say the fashion industry, which maybe we need to say the garment industry so that it gives you a better idea because otherwise it's hard to think, how could the fashion industry, that tiny little you know, thing in Paris, <laughs> have such a, have such a big and negative impact on the earth, but it's because we all wear clothes and we all wear a lot of clothes. And the, the connection between fashion and climate is, comes both at the very root of the supply chain and throughout the entire supply chain and at the end of the supply chain. It's not just one place, which is why this industry is so so impactful on the earth and on humans. At the beginning of the supply chain, we have agriculture, and agriculture is spraying chemicals on soil, left, right, and center, not just once in a while. It's like routine spraying 16 times a week in some cases to produce crops. This is when they're produced in greenhouses. They're, uh, this is first-hand knowledge from someone who used to be a tomato farmer and is now a biodynamic farmer farming a biodiverse crop of so many different species of plants and animals, but he used to farm in a greenhouse, only tomatoes. And he said all the, him and all the farmers wore spacesuits to enter the greenhouse, it was so toxic. And they'd have backpacks of chemicals and their job as farmers was to spray the plants and then measure when it was the next time to spray. And he said we were spraying 16 times a week. And he said none of the people in that farming uh, company ever ate those tomatoes. Ever. They were like, they, no one ever would eat tomatoes. So that says so much about how our agricultural system is. Then, speaking about fashion again, you've got how do we process those raw materials? It takes a lot to turn a tree into a fiber, for instance, and we do that a lot. Anything that's rayon or lyocell or tencel or viscose that you're wearing, it came from trees, but it's a chemical process to turn a tree into a dress or a t-shirt. It's not easy. And it, there's a lot of pounding, but then there's a, a bath of chemicals that the wood pulp sits in to degrade enough to become cellulose to be built back up into a fiber and a thread. Then there's the bleaching and the dyeing. So those ble that bleach and those dyes, they're eff they come out as effluents from the factory and they join rivers. And that is having a tremendously negative impact on all the microorganisms in that river which also flows down into the sea or lakes or big oceans and eventually is changing the acidity balance of the oceans. And the oceans are in a, an absolute catastrophe right now. Populations of all the species living in oceans are dwindling so, so much. I mean, facts are difficult to quote because they change all the time, but it seems like about 90% of the population of the oceans are gone. This is why when you go snorkeling, you're like, oh, oh, I think I see a fish. Oh, there's one fish. That's not how it used to be. When you speak to our grandparents' generation about snorkeling, they're like, oh, I was touching all the fish when I was swimming. I, I couldn't help but touch them. There were so many in the water. And this is partly the fashion industry that is having an impact on this water crisis that we have. Then we have the end of life of the garment. When I'm done with it. And even if I keep it for a very, very long time. Maybe I wear it for like 20 years, that would be amazing. And what if I hand it down to my daughter and she wears it for a while? What is that, 60, 90 years? That's amazing, that's a long time for a garment. But if you're a planet, like planet Earth, that's a blink of an eye. It doesn't mean that much to keep garments that long. I mean, let's, we have to stop overproducing. We can't just rely on, oh, use something a lot, and oh, keep going with it. It's still, it's still there, and it will have an end of life. It will go into a dump at some point. Ideally, though, we want garments to be compostable. We want all of what I'm wearing right now, and what all of you are wearing right now, to be able, when it's got too many holes in it or has a stain, we want to be able to put it on a compost pile to be food for microorganisms. That is the beginning and the end of a circular economy, is when we can turn everything back to soil. And whenever I see the graphs and the, 
and, and the pictures of circular economies in, that are thrown around in the fashion industry quite often, that part is forgotten. No one's talking about composting. But we need, that is the end. That's the beginning and the end of the circle. And then you can circulate within the circle a few times by recycling things, but eventually it needs to come back down into soil. And if it's too toxic to become a part of soil, we shouldn't be using it. That would be a really great rule to have. Yeah, I, I think that's an extraordinary way to put it. I, I think when you talk about fashion in addition to uh, cottons and cellulosic materials, you also have plastics. And so uh, one of the great fears I have is that we're, and we all know it's now in our bloodstreams. It's um, and breast in milk. Our, in Plastic our is everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. Um, and if you talk to the Exxon Mobiles of the world or Shells, they expect 75% of their growth. If, imagine that, these giant, extraordinarily huge companies, 75% of their growth over the next 10 years will be in plastics, not in oil, because they see the future. And one of the areas that they're connecting with is the fashion industry. And we wouldn't really talk about fast fashion because if you think of Arizona's example where she passed down a beautiful article of clothing to her daughter and eventually it might end up in the landfill, the reality is, as we both know, um, is that people have the opportunity to buy things for almost no money. The US and the EU, and Canada, a few countries are really responsible for a massive amount of purchasing and tossing. And so people can get clothing at these stores Zara's or H&M, sometimes for one or two dollars for a shirt, and they'll wear it for a few days and it ends up in a landfill. And so whether it lasts, as you say, uh, it's a minute in the Earth's and in, in the universe's uh, lifetime, uh, but it's moving extraordinarily quickly. So we have, in addition to throwing it in a landfill, it, it's amounting to billions and billions of articles of clothing over the years end up there leaching uh, dyes, plastics, and other materials into our water. So it is, a, the, the idea of a complete cycle of fashion is a new idea. Arizona is leading that movement and many others are joining her, but it is still a new movement. Um, it's, I believe last year at the COP, there were maybe one or two side events on fashion. This may be one of the only of two events at the entire COP focused on fashion when it represents Massive health problems, massive plastic problems, oceans problems, agriculture problems. The list goes on. It's as long as my arm. And again, um, if you, we need to move to the next COP and have fashion be a central negotiating point um, and conversation at the next COP because we can't delay world leaders, um, the conversation with world leaders about its impact. Never mind the uh, labor issues. Um, and other issues associated with the fashion industry. But educating the general public about this issue is tough. So what Arizona is doing with DIRT, what Earth Day is doing, are really the beginnings of what we hope will be a massive global education campaign. And we don't want to make it negative. People wear clothes um, to express themselves. So we have to find ways. So we need innovation, I think, is probably one of the most important things we can talk about is where are the great designers, where are the great manufacturers that can develop products um, that will end up back in the soil? I have so many questions to ask Arizona. I don't know where. Um, I love questions. So, uh, <laughs> let me ask you this. Uh, we see, need to see a systemic policy change for global uh, transformation. How can the fashion industry sta stakeholders help lead this? And in addition to the fashion designers and the manufacturers, how does that all work together? Who are the real leaders in your industry other than you and Carrie and a few others? So fashion does need to change a lot. There is so much activity in fashion to become better. And there have been the strong longtime players in the sustainable fashion movement like Ursula de Castro at Fashion Revolution, like Nina Morenzi at the Sustainable Angle. Many more people as well who have been pushing and knocking at closed doors most of the time for many, many years when the fashion industry just didn't care and didn't want to listen and didn't want to know about the impacts that they were causing and felt like, oh, it's somebody else's problem. And now they're finally coming to terms with the fact that it's not somebody else's problem, even if 
the manufacturer who's polluting the river is so many tiers down your supply chain that you don't know their names anymore, it's still your problem. And that's been a, a major shift to realize that in the fashion industry. And I'm really grateful for that shift. What I'm not so grateful for that is also happening in fashion right now is a, a tremendous amount of greenwashing. Tremendous. And greenwashing I've come to define as when a brand or an individual or a company or, or a country starts to talk about and celebrate things they have not yet done. Like, yay, I have great targets. No. Or yay, my ambitions, I'm increasing my ambitions, ever increasing my ambitions. Sorry, you haven't done it yet, don't tell me about it. Tell me what you did. That's not greenwashing. So I would really, really, really like to see the fashion industry start to tell us clearly what has been done. Not what they might do one day if they want to one day, you know, it's just desires. It's not okay to say that, that is greenwashing. Getting really annoyed about this, you can see it. <laughs> Because it doesn't help us. Greenwashing doesn't help move the needle in the right direction. It actually is spreading misinformation and misguiding consumers who are just, let's look at consumers. They're just citizens who have jobs, who's, who don't have that much time. They usually have families as well and they're busy and it's not actually their responsibility to educate themselves to the point where they can see through greenwashing. It's our government's responsibility to put some demands on how companies advertise their change. And I think one thing that we could do here would be to say, okay, what is your proportion of your marketing spend compared to the proportion of, the co of your company that is sustainable? If your company is producing, let's take a fashion company for example, if your company is producing only about 8% of its collection with sustainable materials with a supplier who's not exploiting its workers, then only 8% of your marketing budget go to talking about that. Simple, like that's, that would be great. And we have a wonderful example, not in the fashion sector, but in the um, coal sector, BP. I, I'll, an amazing litigator, Client Earth, who's an organization that does what you used to do, takes to court companies and countries that are misbehaving, basically. They took BP to court because BP's marketing spend was far out of proportion compared to what their renewable energy was, and they won because it, it, that's, that shouldn't be legal. So it can happen. We could actually hold companies accountable to only market and advertise the reality of themselves when it comes to sustainability. And I think that would be a really, really great step in the right direction. Right now, the leaders, just to specifically answer your question, the leaders in sustainable fashion are actually the small brands, the tiny brands who are small teams of people who really care and really know their supply chain. Those are the ones who are making clothes in the best way possible. The big brands have not gotten there yet and they're doing, they're making change and that's really good and I'm glad to see it, but it's not enough. And with all the greenwashing, we really need to see more because we're in an emergency. So if we're gonna transform the fashion industry, um, make it more sustainable and regenerative, what do you think the pillars are to accomplish that goal? The pillars, to, the, the pillars to accomplish a regenerative and at least sustainable fashion industry would be to support farmers to grow fashion fibers using biodynamic or other regenerative techniques that do, do not use any chemicals at all. That's possible, it can be done. And also the processing, we need to make sure that all the processing on fibers is not toxic and if it's putting anything into water, which it usually is, we need to filter that water to the point that it can go back into nature without causing harm. And we need to dispose of those filters responsibly. See, everything goes into the really minute detail and then you get it right. But so often we don't talk about the minute details of what it would look like to be sustainable or to be regenerative. Then end of life, we need to make sure those garments have a place to go. So a compost pile is the best place for them to go. But if you've process them with toxic chemicals, you're putting toxicity onto your microorganisms, which you don't want to do. So we need them to be made in a way that's not, not toxic. And when you compost, you need to also disassemble the garment because if you put all the metal zippers into the compost, the microorganisms can't, do, can't eat that. So we need to make garments that can be disassembled easily. You might need to cut your zipper out, but it needs to be designed in a way that you can do that easily. 
and the instructions can't be too complicated because we have to expect that that garment will be passed around a few times because it's in the circular economy and we wear secondhand clothes now, don't we? So it's such an all-encompassing answer, but it is possible. And then the human aspect. We need to make sure that obviously people need to be paid and obviously people need to be working in a space that's healthy and where they don't experience any kind of abuse at all and certainly not rape, which happens all the time in the garment industry, in the factories, all the time. It's normal and that's not okay. We need to change that. You see, there are so, so, so many things that we can do, but we know how. Like that, that's what's interesting, of all the answers. So the idea that we still are looking for answers is, it's not true. We have them all, so let's just do it. It will cost money. Of course it will cost money, but we've raked in profits for the last decades. I mean, it's okay to spend some of those profits on regeneration and reparations. Let's do it. I love the idea that everything has to go back in the soil, except plastics, of course. Um, although we're after the plastics industry to come up with an entire new formula that would not be based on oil and would be regenerative. Um, but th let me go back to that question of how somebody like you, who's so well known in the fashion industry, how do the leaders react to you? What is, I know there's greenwashing, but when you're in front of them and you're talking to them, what is their response? Everyone's really friendly in fashion when you're talking about these things. And I, it's nice, but also it's kind of like people talk about it at a dinner party with a smile and then not much happens afterwards. So I think we need to maybe find a different way of communicating about it. I love circle communications. I think when everyone sits in a circle, you get a lot done. And, when it, and you get really deep into a subject when you sit in a circle together. And I don't see a lot of circle talk happening in the fashion industry. I don't have the answer to that. I don't, know, I don't know how to communicate to the leaders and make them change. I think it is a lot about putting regulations in and universal yeah. regulations because it's such a global industry that it's, it really doesn't work to say, oh, in Britain, we do it this way. It doesn't work because Britain's, the clothes that are worn in Britain, they're made all over the world. Every single one of them, like one garment usually is made in about seven countries. One garment because of where the cotton was grown, then where the cotton was processed, then where, the, where it was bleached or dyed, then where it was spun, then where it was woven or knitted. Those are two different factories, possibly in two different countries. So you see how seven steps roughly happen on every single garment. So it doesn't make sense to say in Britain, we do it this way. It's just even Italian cashmere. Sorry, have you ever seen a cashmere goat in Italy? No, they're in Mongolia but it's still called Italian cashmere because the processing happened in Italy. But that's kind of greenwashing in itself, isn't it? I would just like to know that it was, <laughs> I'd like it on the label actually to know, oh yeah, the goat was in Mongolia, but then the processing happened in China and then it was sent to be spun in Italy and then it was woven in Germany. And I'd like to know that, just tell me. It might, every garment actually needs a really, really, really long label to tell its story because we deserve to know because there were people all along that process who suffered and the fact that I don't know how they were suffering is actually totally unjust to them because if I don't know, I won't do anything about it. I am being told that we are absolutely out of time. Um, unfortunately, oh. I want to sit here for a few more hours. I want to work with you. Earth Day should be working with dirt to support what you're doing. And we love uh, you. Yeah, we love I you. really want to thank everybody for being here. We have an extraordinary online presence um, thanks to a, some grants with some media companies. So uh, the viewership will be very, very large. So we're really pleased about that. And I want to thank you for being here. Thank Arizona. Thank Kerry uh, thank for being you. part of this. And uh, do think um, about regeneration. Think about what you're purchasing. Uh, think about how you can become active in Arizona's organization and support her and Earth Day. So again, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. And I finally mastered the mic. Yes. <laughs> you're so